Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler Christensen. I'm um, part of the organizing team for the Environmental Data Management Workshop this year. Um, so we'll just start with a couple of, um, of brief announcements. Um, so just a reminder that this session is being recorded. Um, a Google Drive link to the recording will be posted to the website uh, after the workshop. So if you're a presenter, you should have received the uh, likeness and profile release and the Privacy Act statement. And by turning on your camera, you are agreeing to those terms. If you don't agree, please just leave your camera off. Um, if you're presenting and you have not received the notification, please let me know and I'll make sure to get the, the profile release to you. So attendee cameras will be disabled during this session. Um, if, uh, right, uh, so cameras uh, for the attendees are disabled during the session. So with that, I will turn it over to Sudhir and Frank to uh, kick off the session. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tyler. Uh, Frank, do you want to share the screen? Uh, sure. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sudhir Shrestha, uh, and uh, welcome to our, our session on why uh, analysis ready cloud optimized Arco data for scalable cloud computing and data analytics to support open science. Uh, <clears throat> this, this session is you know, co chaired by me uh, and uh, Frank. So I'll, I'll just introduce myself very quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Sudhir Shrestha, I'm with the, the National Weather Service Office of Water Prediction. And, and oh, Frank. Good, good afternoon. Yeah, it's afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning for some folks. Uh, my name is Frank Naviglia. I'm the CTO here at, uh, at the CIO's office. And uh, prior to that, I was the deputy director for high performance computing. Uh, and I'll stop there and we can move on. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, so just ju uh, just to give you a little bit of background what what went into this thought about like you know we came up with this uh, session just to give you a little bit of quick background on that like you know as we all know like cloud computing is changing a whole lot the way we are do our business right and then improving we need an infrastructure that helps enable some of our our science but like you know how important it is to have the uh, infrastructure and software as well as the uh, the the data that supports the the open science that's uh, that's important discussion to have. So we have actually uh, a pretty good uh, uh, presentation from the, the distributing some of those components. If we can go to the next slide, Frank. So we have uh, four presenters. Actually, I appreciate them coming. Take time. We have very different uh, perspective on how we look at the open science. So we have a. I mean, uh, Dr. Eileen Carpenter uh, from uh, from Hewlett Packard, and then we have Aparna from our GFGL, and we have a Manil from uh, National Marshall and the headquarter, and then you know, we have Amy and Alexandra from uh, Development Seed. So we have you will see like there are uh, different uh, talk that that will uh, focus on that. But what we're trying to do today, actually, each of our uh, presenter will go over and talk um, briefly about their work. And then we'll sort of uh, uh, have some discussions about, like you know, what, what, how we're able to enable some of the some of our data to do the uh, open science. And also, like a lot of the times, we keep asking, what is open science? I mean, uh, understanding even open science is like you know, we have our own definition. So what? So it will be interesting to hear from the, our panelists' perspective as well. What is open science and open data, and what is not? Right, so that 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 help us set the uh, set set the um, understanding on what how the open science is uh, being done across the agency and in the industry as well. So so after that, we'll take questions from the from uh, from the from the audience as well, and definitely looking forward to really uh, sort of uh, uh, very interactive discussions that we can have as well as possible during the sessions. Uh, so with that, I'll. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, pass on to the Eileen. Uh, so, so Dr. Uh, Eileen Carpenter is the Earth Science Segment Manager uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. She has held several positions leading the Environmental Applications and Benchmarking Group at SGI and Cray, and as a Business Development uh, Manager for Weather and Climate for SGI Federal. 
and uh, also, also to note, she's our currently she's serving as our NOAA Science in our uh, NOAA Science Advisory Board member. So with that, Eileen, uh, 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 take it away. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of big data when it's distributed over lots of places. So next slide, please. Okay, so before I get into this, um, in my view, what makes science open is when the applications are available to people and the data is available to people and they can do things with it, science things with it. And there's lots of different things people do as scientists that we can think of as, as different extremes. Um, scientists run models. They run numerical weather prediction models or earth system models. And those models may be open source. And you know, in many cases they are, and, and you, can, you can download them and um, look at what's inside, add to what's inside, change it for your purposes, for example. Um, that's uh, very different than if you're doing, or that the infrastructure needs for that kind of work is very different from the infrastructure you need if you're primarily doing um, AI and machine learning. And that's different from what you might need if you're doing um, analytics from climate model data. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Aparna talks about because I think that's, it looks like from her um, title that that's what, you know, that, that she'll touch on that. But when we think about infrastructure, there's lots and lots of variety in the cloud. The cloud isn't a uniform thing. There's lots of instance types and there's lots of different ways of connecting those things together, different, different instances, different services. So I think if we um, expect to do open science in the cloud, we need to provide recipes for resources that are tailored to different purposes so that the users don't have to be sysadmins, don't have to know how to build a cluster and what, how to configure things. And so I just listed a, a few characteristics here. If, if you're going to do modeling, like traditional high-performance computing modeling in the cloud, you're going to need jobs that run across multiple nodes. You're going to need a parallel file system because you write lots of model output, you're going to need compilers, you're going to need node instances that are optimized for high performance computing. But if you're doing primarily um, machine learning work, you're going to need probably a different node architecture. If you're doing training, you're probably going to want GPUs. Um, your storage needs are different. You're going to be reading a lot more data than you're writing, and you need to have storage that's optimized for the purpose, you know, for the work that you're doing. Um, and I think climate model analytics um, spans both of those extremes. And at the end, I'll give you an example of one that's actually much more similar to the uh, running of the Earth system models than it is to some of the other kinds of analytics that I think some of the other speakers will talk about. Um, but I wanna talk about you know, we, 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 we say open data and it's distributed. And if you're doing certain kinds of computing, it should be proximate to the data. So if your data is in the cloud, do your computing near that data in the cloud. But what if that data is in different clouds or different, um, different organizations have made different choices about where to put that data in the cloud? Um, for some work, um, it doesn't matter if you've got, um, if you're running a Jupyter notebook and using a Pangeo stack, you can access data that's in different places and use that data in your analysis. Uh, but if that data is big enough and if your access patterns um, need to be optimized for say bandwidth or latency, you probably are still gonna end up having to copy data someplace. You're gonna to have to cache it someplace. Um, you're gonna choose one of the places where your data is, move the other data to it. And then that, that's problematic. Who's gonna pay for the storage of that other copy while you're using it? And I'll talk more about why you might end up having to do that. Um, next slide, please.
Okay. Another aspect of open science is enabling participation. And that requires that people have access to the infrastructure that they would do the science on. So that is all about allocations, but there's a big equity component here. So the ability to contribute to open science really depends on having access to resources. And open data is not sufficient. You need access to compute resources to do science with that data. And then the question comes down to who pays for it. And one might ask, should NOAA create a private cloud? Um, could it be a user facility the way, say, uh, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility is that's open to any researcher who writes a proposal that that uh, is accepted? Um, or should it subsidize the commercial clouds for use by people outside its own community, its collaborators. And then you might ask, you know, well, if you're funded by NOAA to do the science, that, that makes great sense. Um, if you're funded by another institution, but you're using NOAA data, um, where should you, how do you get access to the computing needed to do that science? And then what about the unknown people? And this is, this is really critical when we talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are people who aren't part of the um, sort of active community that we already know about that we want to enable to do science. And so we have to have mechanisms to support them. And they require training and may need services and data formats and portals that are designed for non-specialists. So I think when we think about infrastructure for open science, we have to also think about how we make that accessible to a very broad community because that's part of what open means to me. Next slide. So you know, when, when we look at um, modeling, there's this funnel and we talk about technical readiness levels. And I think that it's important um, to think about that as well with data. So, and I'm gonna use the, the CMIP experiments, that kind of data as an example, just because it's one that I'm somewhat familiar with. When you're running the models, you're generating huge amounts of data. Then I'm gonna call that the working data set. And I'd say a small number of users should have access to that. Those are the people who develop the models and the workflow that runs the models to create that data. They have to validate that data. They have to make sure that nothing's gone wrong in the modeling system or on the computer so that that data is gonna be useful for science. And I don't think having that data in an analysis ready cloud optimized format is particularly relevant. But once the data is validated, it becomes uh, something that a wider community uses. And so, um, you know, we know that that data gets post-processed and standardized in various ways and then uploaded to things like the Earth System Grid Federation and to the cloud. And, and I think there, uh, this analysis-ready formats are, are probably very relevant. Um, and then, at, at the bottom of this, it's a potentially smaller data set, potentially, because it might not be smaller, but it's the published data. It's the data after the papers have been written and published, and there's some official um, blessing that this data is valid and useful and it's out there and it's open. And that's where I think it's very, very important that that it's findable, that it's interoperable. You know, all, all of these, uh, the FAIR principles and that it is stored in a way that facilitates open science using that data. Next slide. Oh, darn, my, my fonts got garbled when the, when the file was transferred. Oh, well. So now I want to talk about doing analysis near the data when it's big data and it's you're using data 
from different sources that might end up in different places in the cloud. So if you're doing Pangeo style um, analytics with, with Jupyter Notebooks, you can just read the data from wherever it is and that, and that works. Um, but there, there are some problems where that really doesn't work. So I heard a talk this morning about this toolkit for extreme climate analysis that's um, being developed at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And they are doing analyses on extremely large volumes of data. And they're actually very much more like what gets done in the models that generate this data. The data is so big, they're doing a domain decomposition. They have to spread the an analytics out across a large supercomputer. And so they divide up the, the domain into pieces that different processors work on. And then they divide up the time steps into pieces. So they've got a lot of parallelism there. And when you're doing that kind of analytics, you actually care what the latency to read a particular value is. You wanna be able to do this as fast as possible. And that requires having the data in a format where it's efficient to read from disk into memory and then from memory into the registers in, inside the processor. And I think for that work, you want to use the formats that have been developed and are optimized for providing high performance IO in parallel programs like you do in the models that generate this data. So I think there's not one answer about what formats these things should be in. It's gonna depend on who's doing what kind of analysis and for what reasons. And for this extreme climate analysis kind of work, um, you would certainly want all of the data you're dealing with to be near where you're doing the computing. And that might mean moving some of the data sets to the location that the other data sets are in. And I think that's that's all I wanted to start with and we can we can uh, talk about questions later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eileen. I, I think it's, 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 it's a really, uh, the one thing I took out of this one is this, this a, you talk about, you know, the data formats, the one, you know, that's, that, that the origin is created versus how we want to use, probably we'll talk a little bit more about in discussion. So, uh, so with that, we'll, uh, thank you, Eileen. Uh, so we'll pass on to our next presenter, uh, Aparna Radhakrishnan. So, uh, so uh, she's, uh, she's with the GFDL uh, and uh, she's affiliated with the Princeton University's uh, Princeton is the Cooperative Institute for the Modeling and the Earth Science and works for the NOAA GFDL. And her projects and resource area fall under computational modeling and the data management uh, with specific focus on the software workflows, open source frameworks and community collaboration for uh, climate data analysis. And she'll be talking about her work on the community level, community driven uh, cloud initiatives, uh, leveraging software principles. Uh, yeah, up to you, uh, Aparna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sudhir, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in my talk today, I am here on behalf of the Earth System Grid Federation and the Pangeo uh, community. Next slide, please. So first things first, I want to thank each and every one listed here on the slide because this is clearly a community-driven effort. Of course, special thanks to our ESCF Pangeo Cloud Data Working Group, which is open, so you're welcome to join. Uh, also, special thanks to Ryan Abernathy, Phil Kosha, and Sasha, who provided immense help in the uh, slide preparation and content. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So yeah, uh, open science is probably, if you actually dig deep into it, we are all doing something to promote open science in our own little ways for all these years. I think just the terminology is probably much more newer than the concept itself. So here's my interpretation of what open science is. And this is, of course, motivated by the definition and recommendation by UNESCO, which is that we all come together in an inclusive format, inclusive construct 
And that automatically triggers us to ask, what kind of activities, what kind of best practices or principles do we need to think about to make my research, not just the research, but the entire process accessible to not just you, but to everyone in this planet. I think that to me summarizes what open science is. And of course, there are lots of little details about you know, fairness to data and keeping everything transparent, but that's the crux of it. Next slide, please. To also think what makes it difficult, maybe we can you know, stand back and think a little bit about uh, what a data scientist or a citizen scientist for me uh, spend time on when they're actually analyzing data. Uh, this is probably no shock. We will be spending most of our time in cleaning and organizing the data sets. And of course, the data set collection aspect itself. And if we want to address these two things in particular, I think we have already addressed what analysis ready data sets mean and why we need to actually incorporate them in our modeling workflow. But you can also debate uh, you know, what is analysis ready data set because Perhaps depending on the application, only the data user may be able to say if that is analysis ready for their context, but you know, that's debatable. But we need to have some sort of best practice to at least get started and have this 60% you know, go to maybe 20% in the future. Next slide, please. We also don't stop right there. We want to think more about cloud optimized data sets, analysis ready cloud optimized data set, also known as the ARCO, because we need our results, research results like now, and we also often do multi-model analysis. So we definitely appreciate multitasking, which I normally call multitasking. If whether it involves number of processes or number of people from all over the world, we really need that now. Uh, the picture at the bottom, what you see is the diverse group of uh, CMIP6 users all across the world. But we clearly see a need to democratize access to this climate model output if we really want to make research and data that accompanies the research actually accessible. But this doesn't mean that we want to pose some sort of stress or pressure in the anal analysts to learn something new in order to analyze the data set. So we want to also think about something that fits into the ecosystem, the Python ecosystem, more uh, seamlessly. Now, what are we talking about here in the right uh, side? You see a ZAR data store, just an example of that to see this is probably what we're moving towards when we're talking about our core data sets. As you can see, we're not thinking about a file granule anymore. It's an X-ray data set object. Everything contained in just one data set object uh, that is needed for your analysis, for example. Also contains rich metadata and chunk, uh, different chunking mechanisms that you can optimize based on your application needs. Next slide, please. So here to sort of summarize the ARCO data sets, when we have an ARCO-friendly data set, it means we are no longer talki talking about moving bulky data. We are moving compute or analysis closer to where data resides, and that is really supported by the ARCO, um, ARCO practices, I would say. And also um, having the different chunking mechanisms and the ZAR data store uh, with a recent study from Ryan and team, we also see that the throughput is uh, immensely improved with the ZAR data stores. Uh, you can also you know, leverage the elastic resources in the cloud. It's not always about scaling up to, you know, that's the nice thing about the cloud where you can scale it up or down based on your analysis needs. And you can use different uh, you know, environments like, uh, the, like Elaine uh, also talked about in the cloud, which is very customizable. Uh, next slide, please. So basically when we talk about our core data sets, we're talking about something that's compatible with object storage and you have an access via HTTP uh, ingrained, no additional layers there. And when you're talking about big data set, you want to see how we can support lazy computations uh, and also do some intelligent subsetting. And once again, something that fits into the existing ecosystem or more or less fits into the existing ecosystem would be definitely appreciated by an end user. Next slide, please. Now, do we have any ARD or ARCO data set in the cloud? And the answer is yes, and I'll show you where and how next. Next slide, please. So here's uh, a, a presentation that we uh, gave uh, maybe a couple of years ago. This is under the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative, the ESGF, Earth System Grid Federation, and the Pangeo community worked together to have CMIP6 uh, data set published in the Amazon cloud, both in NetCDA format, which is more or less analysis ready, and also the ARCO data sets in ZAR, 
Of course, the origins also were from uh, done under a uh, another grant uh, in Google uh, as well. So not just the data set, we also want to give you mechanisms to be able to find that data set uh, and you know, readily ingest that in your analysis. So that's what the right uh, site here focuses on. We give you something called the intake ESM catalog, both human readable and most importantly, machine readable. So you can quickly search through you know, what's available, what exactly you need for, an, for your analysis and dive into your notebook analysis right away. Next slide, please. Now, regarding how we actually got there, I'll introduce you to the Earth System Grid Federation. It's a globally distributed archive of climate data. This slide should give you uh, a flavor of what EUCF is spanning across different projects, countries, um, and uh, a, a really uh, highly used data sets, uh, popularly used data sets, also printed here in the dashboard if you want to go take a look at it. The data volumes continue to increase. Uh, we have about maybe 20 petabytes of CMX existing data sets, if I'm not wrong. But you know, things are changing, the landscape is changing, user expectations are different, technology is evolving. So we are definitely rethinking ESGF and we're moving towards something that's more accessible and more discoverable. And perhaps we'll be talking about cloud next. Next slide, please. So there are several focus areas in the new ESGF world. And the two things that I wanna highlight just for today is we need to be thinking more about modular, scalable architectures using containers and uh, also about embracing infrastructure as a core approach, which we saw just a few minutes ago. And also leveraging certain uh, standards and best practices that we already have in the community to build search APIs like the intake ESN that I just uh, spoke about. Next slide, please. So in particular, when you think about a data scientist doing things, or again, a citizen scientist doing things, we want to make data collection process pleasant, at least a bit pleasant. So this means we need metadata, metadata, metadata. And we already have a number of community data standards. We just need to remember to leverage those community data standards and build based on that what's already existing. So here you see a couple of examples. On the top panel, you see uh, an API call to actually search through uh, the cloud holdings, for example. And this is done uh, using spatio-temporal asset cataloging, which we are looking into, which will probably supersede Intec ESM in the future, still uh, under discussion. But the key uh, point here is that we are coming up with control vocabulary, wherein you, know, you might have multiple, uh, multiple things that actually speak the same language when you have a control vocabulary. Uh, at the bottom, you can also quickly see how we, such a search API might integrate well with people that are familiar with the user interface style of working, and we want to include them as well here. So the, the example here is a meta grid search interface where you can visualize a stack back in at the back. So supporting all kinds of users and all kinds of formats, or at least thinking of a design that is more universal uh, to you know, people across the world or people that are using multiple data formats as well is very important here. Next slide, please. So uh, here I just want to bring uh, to your attention a couple of things. One is that in the, flu uh, in the future, we are going to make it more inclusive, or the proposal here is to make the architecture of ESCF more inclusive. At the bottom, you can see several different modeling centers coming together uh, here uh, with a federated uh, archive of data sets that the users ultimately use. Uh, but they need to use it uh, you know, uh, in a more usable way, which is sort of key to the future. You can also see that uh, I have a cloud-optimized copy of data and a cloud pl platform there. That's how we got the net series of data sets in the cloud. We now do have a containerized version of the Earth System Grid Federation running in the cloud that, uh, that actually populated the ARD data sets that we were talking about before. But we keep talking about the ARCO, but we still don't know how we are actually producing those ARCO data sets. We'll see that next. Next slide, please. So do we want to provide a pathway, not just a pathway, a reproducible pathway to ARCO data sets? And that's what Pangeo Forge addresses. Next slide, please. So we want to acknowledge that everything that we are talking about today is indeed hard, but as a community, we are coming together and making it uh, you know, a little bit easier and a little bit distributed, even in terms of people. Our core data set making is hard. You know, we have experts everywhere, and everyone needs to come together to produce something that's actually useful and not very redundant. Next slide, please. And again, slide credits to Ryan here uh, for most of the Pangea food slides. Uh, so, Pangeo Forge idea is directly inspired by Conda Forge, 
uh, you can think of recipes being contributed uh, to uh, create packages in Kanda. Similarly, Pangeo Forge comes, uh, brings people together to contribute their recipes on how to produce the ARCO datasets and manage them. Uh, manage them in the sense the community takes credit and also manages that uh, by telling us, you know, how do, uh, how do I produce my ARCO datasets for my analysis? And Pangeo Forge simply gives you an executor to actually run it in a nice CI CD fashion. Next slide, please. So you can also think of these recipes coming together and what we call the feedstock. Uh, the granularity of that is still, uh, again, under debate. But if you look at that feed, uh, feedstock today, uh, next, uh, can you click one more time? Yeah, if you look at the feedstock, you can tell that we are not losing any of the provenance information because, of course, that, there is a, a, a ground truth there that actually made your ARCO data, data sets. Uh, along with the licensing information, everything is captured as part of the Pangeo Forge workflow, which is uh, something that I really like. And also when you click on those, uh, one more click, Frank, sorry. One more click and you will see that you, again, can dive deep into the actual recipe that created the ARCO data sets. Not going into the details now, but you're welcome to check it out. This is a 100% open source project, so please check it out and contribute. Uh, next slide, please. I, yeah. So the data sets that are ARCO friendly now are now uh, sort of written into uh, some sort of storage here in our example is the open storage network. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Open storage network is uh, uh, several sites that support uh, object storage uh, service and each of the partners are actually NSF funded and it's uh, supposed to be a low cost um, alternative and it's not a com commercial cloud provider at all. Uh, so, but you can also imagine writing your ARCO data sets and defining the output to something else like S3 or, you know, uh, Google. Next slide, please. So once again, I want to acknowledge the entire Pangeo Forge team and uh, do uh, welcome you to join the Pangeo Forge on behalf of Ryan. Next slide, please. Might be the last slide. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I did, uh, I'm continuing to learn my lessons. <laughs> These are some of the lessons. In terms of, you know, when we talk about the cloud resources, it's not just the cloud resources that we want to sustain these kind of activities. It also involves people, human resources. So to me, the F and FAIR that we've been talking about may also mean fundability to be able to sustain. And I think that should be prioritized uh, within NOVA or, you know, uh, everywhere. The second is to uh, accelerate research. I think we should probably rethink and not really build things from scratch, but you know, try to extend things, try to contribute, open up an issue in Pangeo Forge, for example, if you want something new. So that kind of uh, community engagement. And thirdly, we love rewards and we love recognition to motivate us. Uh, and beyond citations, you know, data citation or article citation, we should probably be thinking more in terms of what is the impact both to the users and to the research community? I don't know what it is, but I just know that we have to think beyond citations. With that, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Aparna. Very, very, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see some of the concept that you sort of give, you know, some background of what the ARCO is. Yeah, I, I think it will be a really good discussion. I'm looking forward to after this one how we enable what are the challenges and opportunities in enabling ARCO, right? So I really like this last slide, the, you know, the, the, the path towards the ARCO, right? So maybe we'll have some discussion around that as well. So thank you. Uh, so with that, we'll go to our next presenter, uh, uh, Dr. Manil Maske. Uh, so he, he's a senior, senior, senior research scientist at NASA and Marshall, and he, and, okay, okay. Uh, uh, he leads the advanced concepts team for the interagency implementation advanced concept impact project, where he develops innovative data-driven solutions to challenging earth science problems. And Dr. Maske also leads the NASA science mission directed artificial intelligence team as a part of the open science initiative. So he'll be talking about some of his effort uh, that he's leading uh, on, on the visualization exploration and the data analytics VEDA uh, as an open scalable and interactive system for science data. So uh, to you, uh, Manil. Thank you, Sudhir, and thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So 80% of the stuff that I was 
going to cover is already been covered by previous two speakers. So that's good. So I'm going to stay very high level um, and, and talk about this new project uh, that we started uh, about six months ago. And uh, our presenters that is going to follow me, Amy and Alexandra, are a major part of this project as well. So there's a nice streamlined set of presentations you will see. So I'm going to start with uh, NASA's definition of open science. Um, and at a very high level, we define it as a uh, collaborative culture, right? It's a change in culture that is now being enabled by technologies like cloud uh, that empowers open sharing of data, information, and knowledge with uh, inclusivity in mind. And fundamentally, we want to accelerate the scientific research and understand. So that, uh, that's a very high level. And where VEDA fits in is the collaborative and the technology side of the things but that uh, is ultimately going to put our two, two plus decade long open data policy and the uh, NASA Earth Sciences uh, open source software policy into practice, right? Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. I think this is the slide, okay. So why why this project, right? So this is not a new tech, a new software development project. This is basically putting together existing reusing ecosystem of tools that's already out there. For example, Pangeo, which uh, uh, NASA was part of a funding agency for that, and other uh, existing projects that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Put it into this uh, collaborative environment that's enabled by by cloud. Um, which includes the Arco data store that we talked about earlier, uh, the common set of APIs and services like Stack, uh, and 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 a big component of that is allowing allowing scientists to do science using this uh, uh, collaborative environment that fosters algorithm development, sharing of tools, applications, uh, and a big part of that is providing computing resources, uh, not just not just the data and the services, right? Um, and this is also addressing a lot of a uh, lot of the nuances within within our earth science division which is this funding a plethora of tools for specific use cases or specific user groups right and they usually have overlapping scopes they are funded by various programs and we need a place where people can come and just pick and choose a set of tools that are interoperable uh, and, and, and go from there, right? Uh, if you look at, we did some analysis, brute force analysis to look at what kind of uh, tools that have been developed within the earth science. And most of that fall into either data search, ETL, uh, some lightweight processing, analysis or visualization, right? That covers the full spectrum of tools that, is being, uh, that are being funded. So we, why not uh, have this cohesive system that are already out there put into one place make them interoperable and that's the idea behind uh, beta next slide so i'm going to talk about a couple of uh open science related tools that we are bringing into beta so this first one is called multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform basically this is a open source cyber infrastructure development where researchers across the agency you can come and co-develop algorithms. This is specifically designed for biomass uh, use cases, uh, but it can be leveraged for any other uh, use cases as well. So they have biomass mission from ESA and you have a uh, NISAR mission from uh, NASA that, that will be uh, complementing each other. So scientists are coming to, together to bring data sets. I know the mission is not launched, for, but uh, uh, data set, future data sets, how they can bring together and go develop an algorithm and maybe generate a new product and then put it into our right? And that fosters uh, visual scale of visualization like you're seeing here. So that's one of the tools that are open source tool that's already out there and people have we use that for uh, other use cases as well. Next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, next slide is up. Okay. So 
that was some mostly processing the map, uh, processing and collaborative environment. Then you also have front-end tools that are uh, that we have developed, right? Uh, for example, this is a, a dashboard effort that we did for um, COVID-19 as part of the NASA ESA JAXA trilateral effort to demonstrate the effect on environment due to slowdown in uh, human activity. So the, when you had this cloud optimized and the Arco data sets and these lightweight catalog like stack and the front end, it's very easy to put something like this tool together really fast. And the idea here is that standard based data sets and tools and services allows collaborative environment again across three agencies really easy to do. Next slide. So taking it one step further, when you have scaled processing uh, environment that's generating new products and you have another uh, standard-based tool that is used for visualization, you can put these things together really quickly and combine and put together end-to-end -to -end, um, solutions like this quickly. So you do completely different use cases that were designed for two, two different activities or initiatives can come together and play uh, really uh, together really fast, right? So the, the, what's enabling this is this cloud optimized Arco data set we've heard again and again. Uh, next slide. So a lot of these interactive uh, solutions on the client side of the things is also enabled by the Arco data store, right? So that was some so one of the things that was lacking, at least in the NASA or science uh, domain. We had a we collaborated really nice with the science teams to generate these uh, stories that we can tell and explain to the public well, how how the scientific observation results are affecting them. But there's also this data layer, but there's nothing in between that uh, can that can be used to do a skilled analysis or localize these stories for particular use cases, right? So having that layer of interactive data set, uh, data store that's scaled by cloud allows you to fill in this gap between getting from the actual uh, static stories to the actual data. Next slide. So uh, we're also looking into what our users are saying in terms of uh, some of the gaps that we have. So we, time and time again, we always hear about these GIS priorities, right? And, and that's related to our data set not being very friendly to uh, GIS catalogs, uh, such as the Living Atlas, our GIS online and so on. And then uh, sometimes you also, they're also not sure about um, the authoritativeness of that data sets, who's putting the data out there, right? They want some pro proper branding around it. Uh, so we're trying to leverage the Arco to push the GI side of the things as well. And what that means is uh, it depends upon who you ask, but we're trying to look into standard set of services uh, that can facilitate easy integration to some of these existing tools like Esri, uh, RGIS and QGIS and so on. Next slide. So like I said earlier, everything is driven by this central data store, which is the Arco data store, and we call it the Veda data store. Very simple, right? Uh, you have ingest, publish, validate, ETL kind of effort that data producers will generate and push the data into this one of its formats. What that enables is the visualization and processing side of the things. And it should um, support use cases for various different use uh, user groups. Next slide. So what it really means in practice is mapping existing tools that we have and the data stores that we have into this architecture, right? And the central to this is the Arco data store uh, that's uh, supported by a stack catalog. On the collaborative data processing and analysis side, you have the map tool that I talked about earlier. And we are also, um, supporting the Pangeo stack. On the left-hand side, you see all the data stores where the data is coming from, right? So that's on the top, you see some modeling uh, information that's coming from, that have been generated uh, 
uh, and and we are making we're transforming them to Arco and pushing this to a catalog. From the operational side of things, we have the USDs projects that are already generating some of the pro some of their new products into this uh, Arco data store. And depending upon uh, the use cases that we're supporting, uh, we are actually pushing publishing that data sets into Arco as well. So the idea is once you have this Arco and the underlying API, it supports uh, the GIS side of the thing and the interactive dashboard or uh, what we call the beta dashboard now. So again, a lot of this is just a plumbing effort rather than developing a new set of tools. Next slide. So one of the main uh, application that beta is supporting is this uh, project called Earth Information System. Next slide. So basically uh, what Earth Information System is trying to do is to promote use of earth science information for research and applications, uh, but they're focused on delivering a higher level product, uh, which are decision ready in the hands of the end users as quickly as possible, which means it also involves some modeling uh, effort that can be uh, that can be done at much higher temporal and, and spatial resolutions. So we're supporting this activity, meaning that Veda is the data systems for these four thematic use uh, area. You see the fire, active fire, fresh water, sea level change, and greenhouse gas. Next slide. So uh, I wanted to go through a couple of interfaces, right? I, earlier I talked about supporting multiple different types of user groups. So the first one you see in the left is the general public and communication, right? What we're doing here is leveraging the R code to tell a story, right? Really configurable stories so that people on the street can understand how these uh, use cases affect them. So really easy to storytelling kind of approaches. To the right, you see a catalog where data producers can come uh, publish their data and see in this form, or the app developers can use these data sets uh, uh, to develop their own app, right? Next slide. Then you have uh, some decision uh, tools for decision makers. For example, um, they can visualize, analyze the trend, export insights into uh, some other form, or create their own stories about what they're seeing. And then finally, the advanced research, like they like to play around with the data, uh, do a much larger scale analysis. And then you have a Jupyter notebook kind of interface here that allows them to do the actual processing using either map or Pangeo stack. Next slide. So this is my final slide. So I, I wanna end it with this, uh, what we provide to the community, right? In terms of programmatic perspective, program scientists and program managers right we want them to focus on helping the community do the research not de development of a new tool right uh, the idea here is that tools should support the research that they want to do obviously i talked about collaboration uh, that's the key to our open science definition and beta is supporting that uh, and time and time again we get new initiatives at headquarters and we always need to scramble to find solution to that, right? And, and this is trying to address that as well. But from the community perspective, we definitely want uh, people to do science quicker. And I think this allows that. Obviously we want to support open standard. Uh, we want to build community around our open science tool. And this certainly is moving towards that direction. And there are skills across the organization we're trying to leverage as much as possible, the tools that are already developed. And obviously having this tool where very simplified one Arco data store makes integration of future tools really, really possible. So let me end there. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie, thank you, Manuel. Uh, I think it's, it's a really intuitive, it's very interesting talk in a sense, right? You know, what I'm hearing from here is like, no, we need to let the resources do their research and not focus on trying to develop the new tools and, you know, rather than we let them do what they're good, best at and then free up their resource to do something else. So, so definitely it's a really 
a great perspective. I do have some queries to learn. So maybe that is something we'll talk more in, in the discussions. Okay. But thank you. This is very, very uh, interesting talk. Thank you. So uh, our last speaker, and then the, not the least, uh, the next speaker uh, is Amy. Uh, so can we get the slide up, Frank? I think Alexandra was going to start presenting. Oh. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So, uh, Alex, if you would like to share your screen. Sorry, I'm trying to. This is something I should have. And then I'll. And my my own system preferences are having trouble. I apologize. Or probably, Alex, what we can do is while you're trying to figure out, maybe, Frank, if we can share the screen for Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll share it. We can, she can catch up when she gets yeah. the demo. Sorry about yeah. that. That's OK. Here we go. OK. All right, thank you, uh, Frank. So we, our, our um, speaker, um, uh, the Amy Barczowskis, if I didn't, I tried. Uh, she, she's the Earth Data uh, team lead and the, the data engineer at Development Seed. Uh, she works on the multiple projects with NASA and ESA to expose their vast archives of the Earth observation data and make it usable uh, to scientists via open, uh, open science platform. And she's also an engaged member of the NASA Earth Science community, working with the scientists to better understand their workflows and expose new technologies to support them. And we both also work together on, on we co-chair the uh, our cloud, cloud, cloud computing uh, cluster as well. So, you know, and then we uh, she, she's co-presenting with Ale Alexander Kirk uh, from Development Seed as well. All right, same thing. To you, uh, Amy. Yeah, Alexander, did you want to? Um, were you trying to share your screen and not able to do it? Oh, oh. oh, maybe she's rejoining. Okay. Rejoin. Well. I see she joined, but okay. All right. Thanks, Alice. So maybe Amy, you are we you are some, some more, uh, the Frank will help uh, move the slide forward, and then maybe uh, maybe by yeah. the end of that. When she's ready, then we can share her screen for the notebook. Yeah, we can just move the demo um, later on in the presentation. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to be giving a little bit more. We're going to be talking a little bit more through examples and exactly why uh, cloud optimized data. I think we've already touched on it in a lot of these presentations, but hope hope to get into a little bit more details here through some demos. So um, Alexandra is going to come back and do a little demo of the dashboard that we built for the VEDA project um, that Manel just mentioned, and also walk through in Earth Observation API demo. So we've made all of our um, uh, cloud optimized data uh, right now, mostly focusing on cloud optimized geotiffs. We've made all of that available through a stack API. And the demo that she's going to walk through is basically going to surface how those cloud optimized geotiffs using the API and our stack database. So we're using a stack database, a PG stack database, which enables um, the dynamic processing of those cloud optimized geotiffs for different things like time series generation and um, dynamic um, color color mapping, basically, and and how that basic, how those cloud optimized geotiffs support um, these types of complex operations. So it looks like Alexandra's sharing now and probably can go into that actual notebook if she's ready. Yes, thank you guys for your patience there. So we're, we're ready to just dive into the notebook? Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is um, a uh, 
really specific example of what you can do with data if you have uh, indexed it in a spatiotemporal asset catalog and you have optimized that data in a cloud optimized format and you're, you're hosting it somewhere accessible on the web. Um, and for this example, I, I selected some Earth observation data because it's an easy way to show how we can dynamically manipulate the display. Um, but the what the point would be if you have data that is shareable and and ready to use, you can easily visualize it with some open source tools. In this case, we're using a stack catalog. We're using a Postgres database with a stack specific schema to serve an API and a tiling service. So the the stack catalog enables the discovery of data. Um, in this case, I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for some reflectance data from Sentinel inside of a location where I know a flooding event is going to be visible at this in this time range. So I'm gonna search for this very specific use case, but a re researcher or a storyteller might first start here um, looking for what is available at a time or place to begin their discovery. But what I'm doing here is I, I know there's something here I'm interested in. I'm gonna search for it in stack and what I get back is a GeoJSON um, response object with a bunch of features that are every single item that met the site search criteria. And those items are in this case, Sentinel records each with a suite of assets here. So now I have the locations of a lot of cloud optimized geotiffs, the individual bands. So that this discovery is covered, but now I want to, to visualize those data. So I, I want to stitch together the images. I want to select the bands that are of interest to display. Um, and I want to maybe apply an expression or a stretch to, to those tiles on a map. So first I'm gonna register that very same search that I made above, um, but now I'm gonna register it with a tiling service, T-Tiler on the same, same stack database. And now I have the beginnings of a URL for serving tiles in a web map. Um, this registered search gets an ID so that it's a you know, readable URL. This is cached and reusable for different analyses. Um, and here I'm gonna show a couple different ways that with just adjusting the parameters in that Tyler URL, you can get a, a dynamic display. So um, in this case, oh, I'm gonna look at uh, band 12, 8A and four. And I'm gonna form a custom URL. Here's our X, Y, Z. And then we've got some more specific information. I, I don't want every asset in the item. I want these assets to be stacked and I want them stitched together for every item that met that search criteria. And then it's just a matter of hosting that custom URL on a map. Um, and you can see also that, that um, if all I need to do is adjust those URL parameters, I can look at this data in different ways. So maybe a vegetation index that might not be relevant for this selected area, but, but all I need to do is update the, the parameters on that web URL. Um, and I can look at the data in a totally different way. So you can sort of see how um, Mano is displaying this dashboard, but you can see how you can tell a story about the data, dynamically decide how you want to display it from the data as they are in the cloud. 
Um, so it, it accelerates that sharing and discovery. Um, so another, this was a, uh, not that, which is the, apologize operator error, this is what I want. Um, another example of, of what can be done with cloud optimized data hosted in the cloud, um, using the same technologies, Stack APIs and 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 a T Tyler is the the fire information management system that maybe a lot of us were watching this summer for real time identification and visualization of fires as they were happening or as they were captured in overpasses. I think that's what I had to say, Amy. Cool. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. So I want to leave some time for discussion. So I'm going to try and go over the rest of our slides kind of quickly. quickly. Um, so I think everyone agrees a lot on um, sort of why analysis ready and cloud optimized. So yeah, so we're jointly here because we imagine a future where every decision that impacts our planet is made with the best data about the planet. You can go to the next slide. Um, there's an interesting study, uh, you know, that showed how much time, nearly 80% of the time is spent cleaning and collected collecting data. So um, when data is not analysis ready, it makes it really hard to replicate and impossible to automate these, the actual analysis that's happening. So we want to think about data sets and not files, which is where Alexandra's example is helpful because you see how she's querying for spatial and temporal extent, um, not, not actually doing a lot of data management um, herself. That whole process could have been done without thinking about the underlying files. You can go to the next slide. Um, we actually saw this slide in Aparna's, um, Aparna's uh, presentation as well. So cloud optimized, again, compatible with object storage. So this is the file storage alternative to having a lo local disk there. Therefore, we can access it from many computer instances. Um, and we support lazy access and intelligent subsetting through, th this makes it available through high level analysis libraries and distributed frameworks. Next slide. Um, so we have already talked about cloud optimized geotiffs, czar I've included on here in terms of other cloud native formats and libraries, endpoint point tiles and cloud optimized point, cl point cloud. So endpoint point tiles and czar or our new data formats, uh, new ways to store the data, Kerchunk and cloud optimized cl point clouds is um, a new paradigm that we're seeing where we're placing metadata on top of the archival data. So we're not actually creating any new data new data files um, we're just putting additional metadata on top of existing um, on, a, on top of the existing files that are generated as part of the conventional process and then there's a new format called GeoParquet for vector data and go to the next slide um, and then alexandra already surfaced um, the importance of spatiotemporal asset catalogs so um, yeah Ex alexandra what, what else did you want to share about stack I think just that this came up in almost every presentation. It's sort of like a geospatial indexing standard. It's lightweight. It's pretty easy to use. And, and partly that's because it was created by people who use these kinds of data. So yeah. go to the next slide. Um, so now you can have cloud native geospatial data and services. Next slide. Uh, we need cloud. So I think the one message that I wanted to get across also in this presentation is that we need cloud native from the ground up um, to promote scalability, reproducibility, reproducibility, and online publishing. Um, and cloud native from the ground up because um, we also want this ability to uh, have near real time access to the data. So as the data is being produced, we want to streamline the process for which we would deliver data services on top of that data. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I can think about now. Now I think we can sort of structure our thinking in talking about Earth observation data services into these three paradigms. So we have conventional tools with archival data, new cloud optimized formats built from archival data. So that's like cloud optimized geotiffs, and then cloud optimized metadata, which references the archival data. So options two and three support lazy loading, so users don't have to worry about downloading or moving files. So just um, 
yeah, so, so, yeah. So I was just going to say that if, if anybody, you can go back to the last slide. If anybody wanted, um, you know, my interpretation of what lazy loading means is we just read the metadata, which indicates what data is contained and where it, within the files to find the actual data. So only read the actual data from files when computation is required. And um, cloud optimized means that there's an easy win. We can just read the metadata at once. Metadata in one read. You can go to the next slide. So I created, so we created some diagrams to represent these three paradigms. So this is representing the first paradigm where we have conventional tools, pre-processed image pyramids and reverse calculations on data values. So this makes um, imagery a lot faster. So there's no pro processing necessary um, if the map imagery that the user requires, the, the user wants has already been generated in these image pyramids, they're already, they're already generated, they just need to be served to the client. However, it does require the definition of static color maps, um, and we have longer data lineage, so greater loss of data precision. And you also have this aspect of um, R RGB being mapped to data values. Go to the next slide. In paradigm two, we have new cloud optimized formats built from archival data. So I think this is um, what everybody's really gotten on board with is like having these cloud optimized geotiffs or, or czar stores, um, which restructure the data into a cloud optimized format. And um, this is really great because images can be generated dynamically. So there's greater flexibility and more options for visualization. And the time series are calculated from, from these formats, which are created from the original data and not re reverse calculated from image files. And go to the next slide. And then we have this third paradigm, um, which is gaining popularity because it doesn't mean we have to do any um, reprocessing of the original data. We get the original archival formats and we just put, if, if we create the right metadata and structure of those archival formats, then we can optimize our services around them um, at the outset. So data can still be lazily loaded via the metadata. And if the original data is chunked, analysis tools can leverage the chunking of the original data to limit data movement and distribute analysis. However, one shortcoming of this is that there's no um, current solution for generating map imagery. I think it's definitely possible, but the tooling is still being built. And next slide. So one cool use case of this, a real world example is NASA Gibbs world for worldview is considering sort of how it can move from paradigm one to paradigm two. So um, Ryan Bowler, who's the ESDIS data visualization lead said, you know, besides being highly responsible, pre highly responsive pre-generating imagery also means the web services are highly scalable minimal resources are needed to serve millions of tile requests per day so this is this is in favor of paradigm one right it's it's saying that um when you have all the data pre-generated it makes it a lot more scalable and um performant uh, that said it's at the cost of precision and flexibility the imagery is pre-baked to 8-bit values so you can't use it for quote unquote real science, and it's much more difficult slash impossible to customize the output, which is why we want to move toward a more dynamic architecture. So Gibbs doesn't currently provide time series plotting and production, but we have done, they have done some prototyping. The technical bits should be straightforward as well as the science bits, even as so far as the two scientists who reviewed it said the pre precision is quote unquote close enough to the real data to be worth doing, but we're waiting to sell, settle on an API given um, recent discussions with VEDA. So we are collaborating as the VEDA team with the Gibbs on this process. Next slide. Um, so similar diagrams can demonstrate the differences in using all three paradigms for analytics. Um, yeah, I think uh, what I wanted to maybe m make a point of here is that, um, you know, considerations for one is that there's no pre-processing done. Um, but all the data munging is required of the user, which makes all analytics um, very hard to reproduce. Um, for two and three, you really have to still maintain a process for updating the cloud, the cloud optimized format and the cloud optimized metadata. Um, however, it's much, um, much easier to reproduce um, for any user since you just have to lazily load the metadata and not all the files. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so why cloud native? Um, of course, we we all know about. You can make a click again to see the diagram. We all know about all the new data that's going to be added, and we can't hope to maintain all the pre-processing necessary to have any hopes of reproducibility. Um, I think the real the real um, 
it seems to me like the real path forward here is creating good indexing and chunking on top of the archival data in order to manage all of this new data as it's being added in near real time. You can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, standards all the way down. And then uh, go to the next slide. So I'm kind of rushing through here, but there's a really good article about using Kerchunk in era five. Um, and so it sort of gives one snippet here is answers the why cloud optimized. So it's basically showcasing how you can use lazily lazily loading the data with X-ray to lo load approximately 12 terabytes of historical climate data. Um, but it's not a solved problem because unfortunately, due to the sheer size and unfortunately small chunk sizes of this particular era five data set, it requires six gigs, gigs of RAM just to load the mapping. Um, so this sort of surfaces, you know, why even within you you may even be constrained by the chunk structure and the metadata of the original data um, and it's important to think about this cloud these cloud optimized services um, from the initial design of even your archival formats um, and i think that's it for us is there anything okay all right thank you amy uh, and alex uh, so Probably, I think we we only have we've been asked. Tyler just told us that we need to be done by 1:30, so we have on um, 17, 18 minutes for discussions. Uh, so if so I'd like to ask uh, all the uh, all the, the panelists to uh, be here, and so a couple of questions. I think like there are several facets that we talked about today in the discussion, right? What I was trying to uh, this is hard to have all the discussions, but a couple of things I would like to, I wanted to ask, uh, I don't know if there are any questions here in question sections. I want to be cautious about. So there's some questions from Jean, you know, Eugene, and for, uh, okay, then for the I, I so, okay. So just for, the, for, the, just for the, the whole panel, I just wanted to ask one quick question. Like, you know, we talked about how important the arc waves, right? Everybody is talking about arc waves. So it's, it's uh, you know, and maybe in the audience, like a lot of the, we're trying to still figure out what the arc is. Does it, I mean, do we really need arc, right? Do we need a, do we really need a format that's a lot more interoperable and a lot more uh, optimized, right? So I just wanted to hear from your perspective, like, you know, what are the opportunity and challenges uh, like one of the slides I also saw uh, in like Aparna's slide is like, you know, you know, starting from A and going to D uh, to make your data uh, ARCO uh, enable, right? W one thing definitely I, based on what I uh, heard from all the four presenters is like, you know, to do the open science, these are all, the ARCO is one of the, one of the way to enable open science. It seems like uh, when I'm hearing that. But I also wanted to hear from the panel, like, you know, enabling ARCO is to open, due to the open science is easier to say than done, right? So like, you know, what, what are the opportunities and challenges that you have seen based on what work you've been doing to sort of uh, bring from uh, ARCO from A going to the, to the level where the user can use them? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, Amy, and then we'll uh, pass along. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of capacity building, right? So it's basically creating, I think one of the things that we're focusing on is like good documentation. And even with the NASA TOPS program, I think we're excited about a lot more capacity building and how to use how to use those. But I think, I think the big infrastructural challenge is just setting up um, sort of the real time processing to get the cloud optimized formats generated or even like the, um, the metadata generated to have the cloud optimized data and services. Um, so I guess to give a concrete example, of where this was a challenge was um, I tried to use uh, Kerchunk, created Kerchunk metadata store on top of the Mirror C service temperature data set from Podak. Um, however, um, the time series, in theory, that should be just as fast as the Czar store, which exists for that. 
However, the the data itself um, didn't contain in any any internal chunking other than the files themselves having a temporal a daily a daily cadence. Um, so again, it was just a limitation of how the file was generated itself. And so I think that we need, yeah, like I said before, we need to start thinking about if we're gonna use something even like Kerchunk, um, um, that we're still gonna be limited by how the uh, data is originally stored. Okay, well, thanks, Amy. So Aparna, I, I think like, you know, some of the workflow that you talked about, right? I was not even aware of some of the work that we already have the, you know, the, the data in the ARCO format. That's a way to use some of the work that you've been. So, you know, based on your work with the NOAA, like, you know, where do you see what are the challenges that you have some of the prototyping your data sets, right? There are always a challenges, you know, can you share some of the challenges and opportunities in bringing that data to enable be someone doing the science, right? So yeah, can you talk briefly? Uh... Sure. Um, I think there are maybe two broader challenges. One is the technical challenge, and the other is, uh, like I always mentioned, the human resource challenge. The second, I really don't know how we would actually address, but we somehow managed to do it now. Um, but I think uh, the way we have, uh, or the Pangea Forge community has designed Pangea Forge, I think it would help when everyone comes together and starts contributing recipes or tell us how that our, our code data set that you want in your workflow should be generated. So if we think about each person generating their own ARCO and then creating one another, one, uh, you know, the sort of called dark repositories in CMIP6, where we have a big archive and then everybody has their own smaller archives, which makes analysis easy. But if we can think about making that a little more centralized, at least the machinery that's being used a little more centralized, I think that would help overall uh, in terms of the technical challenges for uh, generating ARCO. This may also you know, reduce the human uh, resource challenge because it's not just one person doing that anymore. If the data scientist wants a specific ARCO format and specific things, uh, specific ways of chunking, um, not ignoring the limitation that uh, Amy also uh, suggested, I think it will be great. Uh, but we just need to you know, get started with that, is what I think. Uh, I mean, there were so many other challenges with uh, respect to the pre-processing and the post-processing that were needed, uh, even to get that ZAR data sets, because just validating the CMIP6 data sets as is in the archive, was a very time consuming uh, thing that uh, you probably know there were several other packages written to just address the post processing and the pre processing activities. So, but this, you know, because of these initial lessons, I think the rest of the community could make use of that while we think about newer or different approaches to actually uh, approach the same issue. Okay, thank you, Aparna. So, I, I do know, like, you know, with the some of the jar data sets, like, you know, especially on the chunking side, optimization of the chunking size is a challenge, right? Because we do not know the chunking size depends on the use case, right? Like, have you guys done any sort of optimization benchmarking or? Or anything in that domain? I think the jet. Um, so th there are some general guidance to what the chunking size should be. I hear it's like 100 megabytes or so. Uh, for now, Pangeo Forge uh, does the ch chunking only based on time dimension. But of course, there are other tools that are already available open source, like a rechunker or something, where you can think of doing a, a, you know chunking across a different dimension based on what your application is. But I think that would not be a one-on-one. That would be an advanced thing to do once we actually have this machinery set up. But it really poses uh, or creates a lot of opportunities, not just thinking about how complex chunking can be, but if we think about if we do chunk it the right way, um, looking at the parallel throughput that we are actually seeing with ZAR and the saturation that actually is reached with uh, you know, other uh, mechanisms, I think it's worth a shot. Uh, people are using it, so I'm inspired by that. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Aparna. That's that's very positive note. So. Uh, in that line, I just want to also add to the have a quick uh, question to Eileen as well. Uh, so she's talked about some of the architecture, you know, that enables, uh, enables uh, 
this open science, right? Because in, in your talk, you talked about like, you know, we have like, uh, we need to come up with the analysis where that data in a sense, like, you know, there is like a, a higher higher level of data sets, which is very detailed and granular, but also there is a, the data may or may not be required to be used by all, all of them, right? So the data need to be developed in a way that, you know, it's about, it's usable from all use cases, right? So you, you talk about like your high performance that uh, going to the smaller data. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that has a lot of perspective on enabling the open science, right? And also if you can talk a little bit about from the architecture side from the industry perspective, right? Because, you know, the data we have, even in Windows, you know, like, you know, those are some, some of the data are very complex data sets, but we also have a users like say, like a cities or others who may not have that, you know, ability to consume those data sets, right? So that means uh, there's a lot of the times we have data sets that are, we say is open open data, but still that is not interoperable, right? right. So if you could give some perspective and some of your uh, thoughts on that, that would be very helpful. So I think that people do science at lots of different scales and with lots of different degrees of either specialization or multidisciplinariness. And especially for the multidiscipline stuff, it's really important to have um, to have these analysis ready data, data formats and cloud optimized data and all the metadata. But but there's other portions of open of open science in the sense that it's not classified, it's not secret, it's not um, hidden. That is practiced by a very narrow community that's very, very deep into some specific area, right? And I think open science needs to um, be inclusive of that whole scale. That the scientist who is very specialized and doing something that's science on data that has no reason not to be open, um, that their work is also valid and we also need to support it, right? And so I think not everything, I think there's not a one size fits all answer here. And I think that um, sometimes the open science community is focused on one segment of the sort of interdisciplinary analysis and consumption of data. And I just say that's not that's not the only thing that's important. Okay. All right. Thank right? You. And uh, yeah. Right. So so my, my next question to goes to uh, Manil to, to, to think about like you know I really like the whole concept of your data, right? I, I think some of the as, as a technologist, I have a challenge in a sense, like, you know, we have so many, uh, so many options available to enable the data, right? There are several, like, you know, API, there are several servers, there are thread servers, there are many servers, right? But as a user, from my perspective, hey, I do not know all those 100 type of solutions. How am I gonna actually use all of them? Is it possible, right? But so far before, I, I never thought like, you know, there will be a concept like, you know, where one stop shop sort of concept I saw Manil in your data, right? It's like, no matter what, where it's coming from, if you're a user based on that, we'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to use some of those data to make some sense out of it, right? So the, the one I'm, I was looking at your, like a VEDA, uh, in, you know, the architecture design, it seems like, you know, that's taking care of all those, right? So. So like in, in, in your sense, like, you know, how, what, what, what is the challenge that you faced? Like, you know, I know showing that architecture is very simple to show, but what goes behind scene to enable that? I think that is the opportunity for us to also learn how, how to enable that because we also have so many like data sets that comes from Esri shop, we, that comes from the open source shops, right? That comes from many APIs and we don't know what to do with it, right? So it seems like that approach that you're using is very, very valuable to the science community. Definitely would like to hear what are the challenges and how, uh, the plans where, where to get there, I think. So uh, I, I do wanna clarify one thing. Uh, I don't think there is a one solution that satisfies everybody. We can never assume that. 
And I, I, I don't think that's the approach that Veda is taking. What we did was look into uh, 80-20 or 70-30 kind of approach where what is the approach that satisfies 70% of the needs, right? And when we looked into uh, science use cases, uh, it was obvious that cloud optimized geotiff and czar at this moment will suffice those needs. And that's where we went with Arco with mainly uh, COGS and czar. Now, uh, earlier, Aparna said uh, that it's, it's, it's very difficult technically and resource-wise, it's very difficult right, to, to take large-scale data systems like NASA has and, and converting that into Arco. So the approach we're taking is doing uh, one application at a time. For example, EIS is what we mentioned. We started with the dashboard approach where we looked into thematic areas and target data sets. And it was obvious when we actually did it ourselves especially the case of air quality during COVID and showed it to um, the science team. The, the type of interactivity and performance that it was enabling on the client side was uh, very impressive. They were very impressed with it. So what happened after that was why not, why not uh, make this more generalizable and apply to other data sets? So we created a recipe uh, to do how to do ARCO Right, put together a, a best practices and set of steps. Uh, the goal for them was to follow that steps, and they could uh, they could do their own validation. Even even if we did the uh, data transformation, we had to go back to them in terms of validation. Right now, it's self sustained within them. So training is a big aspect of this. I think uh, you probably have heard the NASA Tops effort, uh, and that's the community and community building arm of the uh, NASA's open source science effort. And we are trying to leverage a lot on, rely a lot on them to, to teach people how to do this uh, on their own. So, so that I think sort of addresses what Aparna was saying in terms of resource aspect. We're, try, we're not trying to do everything for everybody. We're, we're trying to okay. uh, let the community do it. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Manuel. And thank you everyone. Yeah. I think like, you know, been, so Frank has been telling me, okay, we have only three, three minutes left before we go. So I, I wish I had a lot of more questions, but I, we, we just ran out of time. Uh, so with that, I, uh, I would like to take time to thank all our presenter and uh, our audience who, spent, who took time to come and hear us. But uh, I think what I would like to say is like, you know, I, I, this conversation doesn't need to stop here. We would like to find the opportunity to work towards the platform to collaborate with us. So please, if you have any questions, please send uh, send it to Frank and us uh, if you didn't have a chance to ask to the uh, panel, and then we'll make sure that we will have those answers there. But definitely, we'll probably collect and have this sort of a group to have a, some sort of discussion out of uh, coming out of this group if the uh, the audience is interested on that. Uh, but it's, it's been a very interesting uh, uh, topic to discuss about ARCO. There's a lot going in ARCO. I know I knew the 90 minutes is that we're not going to cut it, right? But definitely like took it, uh, we took a challenge on it. So definitely want to take an opportunity to thank all our presenters and all our audience. And I'll uh, give it to Frank uh, uh, to close out and then to uh, uh, Tyler. Okay, well, I'll just add my uh, quick, I know we have a minute left, but thank you to all the panelists. I, I really appreciate the perspectives we had, and, and I think that, I'm sorry, there's a little background noise here. Uh, you know, you know the, the, the infrastructure that we need to support this spans a couple of different areas, right? Obviously, computing, software, uh, more, most probably most importantly, people. Uh, and then I think uh, Manil said, you know, the object is to get this, the science done faster, right? So. Uh, I, I think the interesting aspects of how we, how do we deal with, you know, workforce software, computing to kind of converge on that. How do we get the science faster? So I, I appreciate all the perspectives and thank everybody for their their time today. And with it now, we'll uh, pass it to Tyler. Great. I just have one quick reminder that um, our um, <clears throat> our next activity is um, a plenary session uh, that's focused on stakeholders, starting at one forty five. Um, we'll have a panel of external NGO stakeholders discussing how NOAA's partnerships can help build towards our data goals. 
Uh, and then our own illustrious uh, Dr. Anand Garcia will finish the plenary with his remarks on international partnerships and the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And then the next set of workout, uh, breakout sessions begins at 3.30 this afternoon. So please take advantage of the break, step away from the computer, get a snack and come back refreshed for our plenary starting in 15 minutes. And I, I think Tyler, we also have our feedback, right? Uh, the people can provide their feedback, yes. Yes, on the on the SCAD website for each uh, session, there's a feedback um, form. If you have any uh, reactions or suggestions for, um, for the session, please leave them there. Great. And thank you, Tyler, for your help, that's all. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.